That's a ship, Team Kid. And if there's anybody who can go down to the nursery, they can go down too with Miss Sherry. She's making her way out. So. We'll be in prayer for the Junior Church Nursery. During this time, as well, Bud mentioned during the out there about Baptist and the crocodiles. And a joke I heard a while ago, and it's one of the I always remember, there's a teacher, and she sent her students home with homework assignments. And said, your homework assignment, they're learning about religious history. They go home, talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, and bring in something from home that is a distinguishing feature of your religion. And the next day, a little girl came in and said, I'm Mary, and I'm Catholic, and this is a rosary. A boy named Benjamin came in and said, I'm Benjamin, I'm Jewish, and I'm a star of David, and this is the star of David. A boy named Johnny said, Hi, I'm Johnny, I'm Baptist, and this is a casserole dish. <laughs> so that's something I, for, I forgot who said that, but it always kind of stuck with me. But we're going to be back in the book of Matthew today. We began a series last week entitled, Don't Be a Pharisee. And today we're going to be back in the Gospel of Matthew because. As you know, the Gospel of Matthew describes and gives details about the life of Christ. And while Jesus walked the earth, he had to deal with Pharisees. And although you probably won't run into anybody who identifies himself as a Pharisee today, you will, without question, run into people who exhibit the same characteristics of the Pharisees that Jesus warns us about. Last week in Matthew chapter 3, we saw three distinguishing features about the Pharisees in that text. And the first thing we saw is that Pharisees often show up at spiritual events. Uh, when we're first introduced to the Pharisees, they're attending a baptism service conducted by John the Baptist along the Jordan River. And people with that Pharisee mindset have been attending or showing up at spiritual events ever since. They show up at church, they show up at services, but they show up with the wrong attitude and the wrong motivation. And part of the reason why they have that wrong spirit is because we saw last week is that the Pharisees found their righteousness in themselves. Mm. Yes. If you remember from last week, the Pharisees thought they were better than other people based on their history. They said, well, we have Abraham to our father. So we're better than other people. And they thought that somehow made them superior or more spiritual than others. And we saw that that mindset of acting like you're better than someone else acting like you're the only one doing it right and everyone who doesn't do it just like you do it is wrong. We saw that John pointed out and said that's dangerous. If you remember, he called them a generation of vipers. And he called attention to their wrong attitudes and their wrong motivations and their wrong practices so that the new believers that had just gotten saved and baptized would understand that no matter how spiritual some people try to present themselves to be, the Pharisee mindset was to be avoided at all costs. And we saw last week, without question, there are some people who present themselves to be spiritual. They look spiritual on the outside. They talk spiritual. They dress spiritual, that's even a thing. But they're dangerous. They have dangerous doctrines. They have dangerous teachings. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to see more of the dis most distinguishing features of the Pharisees. And today what's going to be interesting is we saw John's response to the Pharisees last week. Today we're going to see Jesus' response to the Pharisees. And once again, the purpose of the study isn't to just point out what was wrong about the Pharisees. The goal is to protect ourselves from falling into the same actions and attitudes that they demonstrated. Because we need to be on the lookout to not allow those types of characteristics to be per permitted or promoted in our own lives or in our own church. Now, Jesus has a lot to say about the Pharisees in this text, so we're going to read the first 17 verses today to try to get a more full and complete idea of of not only the information presented here in this text, but I want to spend some time looking at the illustration that Jesus uses to address these issues, and we'll see how that illustration is relevant for us today. So if you're able to, I'll invite you to join me in standing out of the honor of reading God's Word. If you'll find Matthew chapter 9, and we'll begin reading in verse 1, down through verse 17. Starting in verse 1, it says, And he entered into a ship, and passed over, and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. 
And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is it easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? But ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the, to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go to thine, to thine own house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Verse 9, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew, sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold me not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am come, not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children on the bridegroom, or the bride chamber mourn, as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, then they shall fast. No man putteth a new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put in, fill it up to take it from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Let's open with word for it. I Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your house and do what we're doing today. Amen. Lord, it is a blessing to, to be here after a week that has been very difficult for many of those in our church family. Yes. After a, a week that has been very difficult emotionally. Yes. A, a week that many of our people are continuing to struggle physically. Yes. Lord, we were we count it a privilege to be able to be here, to meet with each other, and to think of those who are unable to be with us and lift them up to you in prayer. And, and Lord, we, we thank you that we have the privilege of holding in our hands your perfect, holy, preserved word. Amen. And Lord, we don't have to wonder if it's true. We don't have to wonder if it's trustworthy. We don't have to wonder if it's relevant for, relevant for us today. Father, we know that it is. Yes. Right. And Father, we're, we're looking at a very familiar passage of Scripture today. And Holy Spirit, you, we know that we cannot understand anything without your help. Amen. We are not smart enough on our own. We are not Amen. good enough on our own to be able to discern anything yes. without you giving us illumination. Amen. Amen. So I ask you to, to speak to us. As we look at this text, I pray that you'll shine a light on this familiar passage of Scripture that we might feel like we already know and reveal something new to us today. Yeah. Reveal to us not what we've always heard from this passage, but reveal to us what you want us to learn today from this passage. Yeah. Lord, as always, nobody needs to hear from me. And the Holy Spirit, I ask you to, to please keep me from saying anything that would be in my own will or my own volition. Yes. I pray that everything that's done today will be for the sole purpose of edifying and encouraging those that are here today, those that are listening online, and for exalting yes. our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's in His name we pray, in the perfect, precious, yes. powerful name of Jesus. Yes. Amen. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. This is a very important passage for us to not only be aware of, but also to understand. Because this is a passage of Scripture that most Christians are aware of. We know that this passage exists. But we don't always dig into to try to understand how it applies to us. Last week we saw in Matthew chapter 3, the very first mention of the Pharisees in the Bible. And we saw their three identifying features. We saw they show up at spiritual events, or they show up where Jesus is, their righteousness was found in themselves, and their teachings or attitudes were described as being dangerous. And today we're going to see some of those dangerous attitudes that are presented and revealed in this text. The Pharisees are first mentioned back in chapter 3, but it's here in our text today that they really start looking for ways to oppose Christ and his teachings. And if you know anything about the life of Christ, this, is, this text is the beginning of the Pharisees following him around and becoming a thorn in his flesh to try to thwart the work of God on earth. They become a thorn in the side of Jesus. They become a thorn in the side of his disciples. 
and they become a thorn in the side of all the all those who continue to try to follow him. Mm-hmm. And I just want to point out three things today about what this text says about the Pharisees. But we're also going to look at how Jesus responded to them and how his response applies to us. And the first thing, if you're following along on the back of your bulletin, there's an outline for today if you'd like to follow along or take notes. And the first thing that we see today is their opposition to Christ. In verse 3, we see them starting to look for reasons to oppose Christ. Now back in in chapter 3, when John called them a generation of vipers, they don't really respond. Okay, they remain relatively quiet, but now they come and they confront Jesus, and they come back with more vitriol. They come back with, with an agenda. In verse 2, we see here that Jesus heals a man of the palsy, which is essentially a form or a type of paralysis. And at the end of verse 2, Jesus says, Son, be of good cheer, thy, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, we need to stop here for a minute and recognize what has just happened. We need to recognize the magnitude of this particular moment. And in order to do that, keep your place here in Matthew chapter 9, but turn over to Luke's account of these miracles found in Luke chapter 5. Over in Luke chapter 5, if you look down at verse 18, this is Luke's account of these same miracles performed by Jesus, and also the same account of Jesus' interaction with and response to the Pharisees. And in Luke chapter 5, down verse 18, we see this man who was sick of the palsy brought to Jesus. And if you look at verse 20, Jesus says, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. But then down in verse 21, it says, The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, I, I wanted to turn to, to Luke's account to make note of this, because in our text for today, in Matthew chapter 3, this miracle is recorded in Luke chapter 5, which we just saw, but it's also recorded in Mark chapter 12. But I wanted to look at Luke's account to quickly point out that the Pharisees are there. We mentioned last week that Jesus often would address the scribes, the Sadducees, the lawyers, and the Pharisees together. So even though in our text in Matthew doesn't label the Pharisees specifically, we see that Jesus was addressing them, that they were there. Now if you're still open in Luke chapter 5, we see there that their first objection... Their first accusation, their first opposition to Christ, when they said, who is this that speaketh blasphemies? Who can, for, who can forgive sins but God alone? And back in our text in Matthew chapter 3, if you look at this, right after Jesus heals a man physically, right after he heals a man spiritually, Look at the very first words out of the mouths of these supposed spiritual leaders. Their first response in verse 3 is an accusation. They said, this man blasphemed him. Now, why is this such a big deal? Well, if you look ahead to verse 6, Jesus said, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Mm -hmm. But they accused him of blasphemy. And in doing so, they rejected both his kingship and his sonship. They rejected his power to forgive sins. They rejected that he was actually God. And they rejected that he was the son of God. That he actually was the Messiah. And we see the quote-unquote spiritual people who have just witnessed, they have just observed First hand, Jesus performed a miracle by healing this paralyzed individual. They've seen this man healed from his physical condition and saved from his spiritual condition. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 15 verse 7 that there is joy in heaven when one person gets saved. But look at verse 3. Instead of rejoicing, Hmm. instead of celebrating... We find the Pharisees accusing Jesus and opposing his working. Mm -hmm. And here's where we have to pause for a minute for application and realize that any time Jesus works in someone's life, any time we see God do something only he can do, and only God can heal, 
Only God can save people. Amen. And if we see God do awesome things in the lives of others, if our first reaction is not to celebrate and praise God and give glory to God, then guess what? We're more like the Pharisees than what we realize. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. If we can't get excited about what God is doing for other people, then we're more like the Pharisees than we probably want to admit. Mm -hmm. And then we look back at the text, we have to ask, well, why weren't they excited about what Jesus was doing? Why weren't they jumping for joy over what Jesus was doing? Because he was doing things in ways they had never seen or done before. And we need to be careful that when God does something for another person or another church, if there's a church where people are making professions of faith and they're seeing people get saved, if our first inclination is to question their methods instead of praising God, then we're more like the Pharisees than we want to admit. Mm -hmm. Now, we just finished up a series a couple of weeks ago about getting fired up for God. And one of the keys that we saw to doing that was to get fired up about the things that God is fired up about. And without question, God is fired up about people. Yeah. He loves people. He gave his son to die on the cross for people. Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. He was all about people. There is nothing that brings God more joy than when somebody gets saved. And here we have the Pharisees who witnessed that. Yes. Amen. They saw the single act that brings God more joy than anything else. They saw this man get saved, but they weren't celebrating. Hmm. And if we can't celebrate over what God celebrates... If we can't rejoice in what heaven rejoices over, then we're probably guilty of being more like the Pharisees than what we want to admit. Mm -hmm. And here's the underlying issue. They didn't celebrate or rejoice in what God did because even though they seemed spiritual, even though they looked <coughs> spiritual, even though they acted spiritual, they were actually opposed to Christ. Mm -hmm. And that, opposi that opposition to God was revealed in a very telling way. It was revealed in how they reacted when God healed and saved someone. When someone gets healed of some physical affliction, what is your response? Do you care? Do you even notice? Do you rejoice on behalf of that person? Amen. When someone gets saved, what is your response? Yeah. Do you celebrate? Mm. Or do you, as we see in verse 3, do you secretly say within yourself, well, that's not the right kind of church. <laughs> they don't have the right standards. They don't use the right Bible. They don't have the right music. If your first response to hearing about someone getting saved is anything less or different than praising God, then you're probably more like the Pharisees than what you really want to. Yeah, amen. 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 Before we move on to the next point, we have to ask ourselves, how does your response to what God does for other people reveal about your response to Christ himself? Because we see here, the Pharisees didn't rejoice. They didn't celebrate based on what God had done for this man. Amen. Because the Pharisees were opposed to God. <clears throat> They didn't celebrate what God did because he didn't do things the way they thought they should be done. And clearly, if you're for God, you should celebrate what God is for. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't run around and get all excited when you hear about somebody getting healed or saved, that you're a Pharisee. I'm just pointing out that if you don't get excited and praise God when you hear about someone getting saved or healed, your response is the same as the Pharisees. Mm. Right. And whether you intend it to or not, your response to God's working in people's lives can be the same exact response as this group of people that Christ warns about to avoid. So first we see the Pharisees' opposition to God. Next we see their separation from people. In verse 9 it says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, 
Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? So once again, we see something take place that should have excited these quote-unquote spiritual people. Yes. In verse 9, it says that Jesus called a man named Matthew to follow him, and he did. Amen. That should excite us. Yes. We should get pumped up. We should get fired up. We should get psyched up. We should get... We should geek out. Uncle Gary said, I don't know what the kids say. I heard a kid say geek out. We should geek out <laughs> when people follow Christ. And here we see something awesome. Jesus passes by and says, hey, Matthew, come follow me. And guess what? He actually does it. Right. Yeah. Think about the people in your life right now. The people on your heart right now. The people you're praying for right now yeah. that they would follow Christ. Yes. Amen. If you got the news that somebody you love had been healed from a terrible physical condition, if you got the news that someone you love had gotten saved, if you got the news that someone you love had decided to follow Christ, how would you react? And, and I'm not saying that for any other purpose other than to be honest there are some people I'm praying for right now for God's healing yes. Yes. there are some people I'm praying for right now to get saved yes. Yes. there are people on my heart that I've been praying for for a long time that they would, turn, that they would follow Christ or that they would turn back and start following him again yes, yes. And I can't say with certainty how I would react or how I would respond if God healed my mom of cancer completely. Yes. Mm. Amen. I don't know how I would respond if God restored Cheryl's health completely. Amen. If God touched Milton's body and just completely healed him. Yes. Amen. Mm. If God touched baby Charlotte and little yes. Gus, we've been praying for, Amen. and healed them, I'll be honest. I don't know how I'd respond to that. Mm. I've got family members that I love with all my heart. That for as long as I can remember, I've prayed every single day that they would get saved. Yes. I've got family members, I've got people I love that claim to be saved but aren't following God. Yeah. Yes. And if I were to find out the people that I've been praying for finally accepted Christ and got saved, I don't know how I'd react. Mm -hmm. If the people I love decided they're really going to follow Christ, again, I'm not joking, I'm not being facetious, I'm being serious. I have no idea how I would respond specifically, but I know one thing, it wouldn't be like these guys. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. 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 If you look at verse 10, <clears throat> Matthew follows Jesus, and other passages let us know that Matthew was the one that invited Jesus to his house for this meal. Mm. And look at the Pharisees' response in verse 11. Again, we, we said last week that a lot of what we're going to see about the Pharisees would be funny if it wasn't so sad. But look at their response in verse 11. Why is Jesus hanging out with publicans and sinners? That's the first thing off their lips. Just to recap what's happened. They've seen Jesus heal a man and forgive his sins in verse 3. They've seen Matthew decide to follow Jesus in verse 9. In verse 11, we see sinners willingly gathering around Jesus. And what's the Pharisees' response? They couldn't stand it. That's right. Why? Because we saw earlier, because they're opposition to Christ. Yes. But also we see here, because of their separation from people. If you look back at verse 11, we might find the single most ridiculous statement of accusation in the entire Bible. Seriously, look at what the Pharisees' problem was. Look what they take issue with. They were upset that Jesus was eating with publicans and sinners. Well, Matthew was a publican, and it was his house. So, of course, he was going to be there. And sinners, 
That includes everybody. That's right. Look at the verse 13. Jesus said, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners mm -hmm. to repentance. Right. Jesus yeah. said, sinners are why I came. Sinners are why I left heaven. Sinners are why I died on the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get it twisted. God has never loved sin, but he has always loved sinners. Yeah. And I'm thankful for that because I am one. Yeah. Yeah. Romans chapter 3, 23 says that all have sinned yeah. and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10 says that there is none righteous, no, not one. And I am so glad that when God healed me, that when God saved me, when God invited me to follow him, that when I decided to do that, he didn't stick me at a picnic table outside. He didn't confine me to the kids' table far away from me. He said, when he invites me and says, pull up a chair, come close to me, and get as close as you want. Amen. Amen. Yes. But the Pharisees didn't like that. Hmm. And it's important to know why. It's important to know the reason why the Pharisees labeled this particular group that Jesus was eating with publicans and sinners. We already talked about the Luke chapter 5. Matthew is referred to as Levi, and he was a publican or a tax collector. Mm -hmm. And then now, I think in around verse 27, Luke chapter 5, it says that Levi or Matthew made a great feast in his house and invited Jesus. So Matthew literally was a publican. That was his job. That was his occupation. And the rest of the people there were, without question, they were sinners because, again, everyone's a sinner. But the Pharisees weren't referring to them as sinners because they were sinners. They called them sinners because they did things differently than the Pharisees did. They called them sinners as a way to draw a line of distinction between them and themselves. Now, we understand that there are two kinds of people. There are saved sinners and unsaved sinners. Mm -hmm. But the Pharisees didn't believe that. Remember, the Pharisees didn't consider themselves to be sinners. They thought they were okay. Remember, we saw last week, they said, we have Abraham to our father. Mm -hmm. They thought they were better than other people because they knew the law. They thought they, were, they thought they were better than other people based on their ancestry or their heritage. They thought they were better than other people because of their spiritual or their social status. And here's the really important part for our discussion. They thought they were better than other people because they did things a certain way. When the Pharisees called these people sinners, what they were doing is they were using that term to label those who did not hold to their particular practices and teachings. And here's what we have to consider for our own application. None of us, hopefully, would call other people sinners in the way the Pharisees did, while basically acting as if we're not sinners ourselves. And, and to their credit, most Christians don't do that. Most Christians understand that we're simply sinners saved by God's grace. Amen. Yes. Amen. But although we might not label people the same way Pharisees did, we have to be careful not to separate from people the way Pharisees did. Hmm. Now, this is a touchy subject. I'm going to try to handle it carefully and sensitively, but I'm going to handle it biblically. And there are some things that need to be pointed out. Some people, whether they intentionally decide to do it or if it just kind of happens in their lives, live their lives in a spiritual bubble, so to speak, where they only hang out with, talk with, and do life with people who look, act, and believe just like they do. They go to church and their only friends are at church. Their families at church. And church becomes their only source for socialization and relationship. And let me say this. It's great that our church feels like family. It should feel like a family. That's what God intended. We're all, all part of the family of God. Yes. Right. But it needs to be pointed out that isolation from everyone who don't believe the exact same way we do is not what God intended. And that's not the life that Jesus demonstrated. Right. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, if you want to turn there yourself or write it down, Jesus himself describes himself as a friend to publicans and sinners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, I said I'm going to be sensitive, and, I, and I'm going to be. But this next statement might sound a little harsh, so I'll apologize in advance and ask you to just kind of give me the, the, a moment to explain what I mean by this statement. Jesus called Christians a peculiar people but he didn't say that we're supposed to be people that the world looks at like a bunch of weirdos. Right. That's right. <laughs> In some churches, even Christian churches, even cr churches that have saved people in them, 
take on the feel of cults. Yes. They only talk to each other. They only interact with each other. The kids in the church grow up and marry each other. There is no connection to anybody outside their church. And can I just say something personally? Not that it was me talking. That's creepy. Yeah. That's weird. I'm a Christian, and that's weird to me. And listen, I love the church more than almost anything. But the church is God's design to reach the world, not right. to hide from it. Right. 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 The church is God's plan for salvation for sinners, not isolation from them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I can already anticipate some of the angry texts and emails. <laughs> what about 2 Corinthians 6, 17, where it says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. Ask yourself, do you really think that what God is saying is to hunker down with your friends from church and separate completely from lost people? It had nothing to do with unsaved people? Is that really what we think God's saying? Does that sound like the intention of a God whose express purpose is to seek and save the lost? If people like to use that verse as their justification for hyper-separatism, to separate from everyone who doesn't worship like they do, or dress like they do, or use the same version of the Bible they do, but they don't read it in context. The verse before it says, In what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What God was saying was, don't worship idols. He wasn't saying, don't interact with sinners. He, he wasn't saying, don't have anything to do with people or churches who are saved, but don't practice the same way you do. That's not what God said. Mm -hmm. Now, verse 14 of that text does say, be ye not unequally together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? But being yoked with unbelievers is a completely different discussion than having fellowship with believers who have different standards than what we have. Right. And it's completely unrelated to not having interaction with unbelievers. Yoked literally means joined together, okay. completely connected. Now, obviously, it's not wise for Christians to enter into physical relations such as marriage with someone who isn't saved. The Bible makes that right. clear. Right. But there is no way you can take that verse in context and use it to justify completely isolating from unbelievers or staying away from Christians who don't believe the same way you do. You can't do it and keep that verse in context. And this is what the Pharisees got wrong. And this is what a lot of churches and Christians have gotten wrong. Look at verse 13 here in our text in Matthew chapter 9. These aren't my words. These are Jesus' words. If you have a problem with it, take it up with him. Jesus said he didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. Amen. As a church that exists to glorify God, we don't exist for people who are already saved. Right. We exist for the people who are not yet saved. Right. Amen. We don't exist... Solely for saved people. We exist for the lost. Yes. And if lost people don't feel comfortable in our church, if lost people don't feel comfortable around us as Christians, there's a problem. Because when we look back at verse 10, lost people felt comfortable around Jesus. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and Jesus was equally as comfortable around them. Mm -hmm. Now this is not to say that we should condone or accept sin. That's not what I'm saying. And we're going to see how Jesus responds to sin in particular later in this series. But our mission is not to, get, is not to gather together with people who are, are already saved and worship God and praise God with people who already believe and practice just like us. That's great. That, that's an important part of our purpose, but there's an even more important part of our purpose, and that's to seek and save the lost. Amen. And see, the Pharisees had a problem with Jesus spending out. How are they going to hear about Jesus unless we're willing to meet them where they're at and sit down with them, accept them, and treat them the same way Jesus did. Amen. That's right. Amen. So we see two things about the Pharisees. We see their opposition to Christ. We see their separation from people. And now we're introduced to a different group of people that come to Jesus. And in verse 16, we see a thought-provoking illustration from Jesus. In verse 14, it says, then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? Now, this is important because we have to understand the context of this question. When the Pharisees said in verse 3, This man blasphemeth. And in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 5, verse 21, where they asked, 
You know, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They, the Pharisees weren't asking questions because they sincerely wanted to know why Jesus was doing these things. Mm. They already had their mind made up about Jesus. They refused that he was the Son of God. They refused that he was, they had the yes. power of God on him. Right. They, they didn't like him, and they were opposed to him, and they were going to reject everything about him because his teachings didn't line up with theirs. But in verse 14, we see here the disciples of John the Baptist, they come to ask Jesus a question, and the difference is they were sincere. The Pharisees asked, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins? Who does Jesus think he is? But the disciples of John asked, why? Why are you doing this differently? And Jesus' response is very telling. When the Pharisees questioned Jesus out of contempt in verse 4, it says that Jesus knew their hearts and he said, why well, think ye evil? But when John's disciples asked him a genuine question, he responds by explaining it to them using an illustration. And can I just say, it, it's never okay to question if God is who he says he is. But it is okay to ask God why when you don't understand something. We saw last week in James 1.5, five says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not. If you genuinely and sincerely don't understand something, the Bible says, ask God. He'll give you wisdom, and, and he won't rebuke you, he won't make you feel guilty or ashamed for asking. And, their right. question, and the question here of John the Baptist, his followers, was, well, how come we and the Pharisees fast a lot? But Jesus, how come your, Pharisee, how come your followers don't fast like we do? Hmm. And the natural question, at least it was to me, was, well, if these are John the Baptist followers, why aren't they asking this to him? But it's because John the Baptist was in prison at that time. Mm -hmm. in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, it tells us that John had been cast into prison, and he would end up remaining there until Matthew chapter 14, where he's beheaded by Herod at the request of his wife Herodias. That's another thing. A husband named Herod and a wife named Herodias. That's like me having being named Garrett and have a wife named Geredius. I, I, don't, know if, I don't know if I could do that personally. But anyway, John's in prison. And what's interesting here is that just a couple chapters later in John chapter 11, John the Baptist himself sends messengers to Jesus wanting to know more about why Jesus is doing yep. what he's doing. Yep. So it's not, it's not a problem to ask Jesus why. It's okay to ask for clarification. So John's disciples come to Jesus and they want an explanation of why Jesus did th things differently than what they had seen done before. They believed in Christ, but they practiced differently than what they were observing him do. Yes. And Jesus uses an illustration in verses 15 to 17 to explain that his ministry was different from both the Pharisees and John the Baptist's ministry. If you look at verse 15, after they ask him why he's doing things differently than they did, look, I want to draw attention to the illustration that Jesus uses. Verse 15, it says, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. Verse 16, No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Verse 17, Neither do men put wine into new bottles, Else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now the key word in this illustration and in these verses is the word new. Mm -hmm. If you look at verse 16, Jesus references a new cloth. In verse 17, he talks about new wine. He talks about new bottles. And in doing so, he both exposes the Pharisees while explaining his mission. Jesus was explaining to, to the disciples of John that he was introducing something new. And the Pharisees, as we've already referenced, were stuck in the past. Yes. They were focused yeah, on the old it. ways. Yes. But Jesus explained, I'm doing something new. Amen. And verse 16, he says, you can't take a new piece of cloth and sew it into an old garment. That won't work. He explained in verse 17, you can't pour the new message of grace into that old container of the law. Mm. What Jesus was explaining yeah. was that when you yeah. mix law and grace, get this, not only does it lead to confusion, look what he says, it leads to destruction. Mm. The bottles burst. Yeah. Grace and the law cannot coexist. We're either saved by grace or we're saved by the law. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And Jesus made it clear, you're not saved by the law. That's right. That's right. You're Amen. saved by grace. Amen. And what we need to remember is that he's not only addressing the unbelieving Pharisees, He's also addressing the believing followers of John the Baptist. Mm. 
And what does he say? Even if you're saved, you can't be opposed to everything that's new. He says at the end of verse 17, when you pour new wine into new bottles, both are preserved. For the Pharisees, Jesus said, instead of pouring this new message of grace into your old container of the law, pour this new message of grace into this new bottle or this new system that I'm incorporating and instituting, and both are preserved. Now, obviously, this presented some huge issues for the Pharisees. The Pharisees loved the old system of being under the law. They lived under the old system of being under the law. Mm. And because they held so tightly to the old ways, they would never experience the new things that God wanted to do. Mm -hmm. See, the Pharisees were against anything new because they were opposed to change. John's disciples, we see, were open to change if it was for God's glory. Yes. The Pharisees were opposed to change, any type of change, just because it wasn't what they were used to. It wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't what they were familiar with. Yeah. That's right. Amen. And here's the thing we have to understand. Some Christians and some churches are opposed to change too. Even though we see that change was a central part of Christ's life and ministry. <clears throat> and the application for us today is pretty straightforward. We can't try to limit God or confine Him to our preconceived notions or our standards. And listen, we are an independent fundamental Bible-believing church. We should be. Mm -hmm. All churches should focus on the fundamentals of the faith and believe what the Bible says. Yes. Yeah. Amen. But much of what identifies some churches that claim to be fundamental has very little to do with actual biblical fundamentals. Right. Yes. That's right. If you were to ask the average Christian, even ask the average saved person, well, what does fundamental mean? They'd probably say something like, like, well, they use the old Bible and they sing the old songs. <laughs> and there's something to be said for traditional hymns that have a strong spiritual message. Yes. But we shouldn't avoid or dismiss newer songs that have a strong biblical message either. Right. And sometimes in our circles we hear things like, well, if it's new, it ain't true. Or people will quote, well, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, if you read Ecclesiastes, what Solomon is referring to, he's talking about the trials and challenges of humanity. They've always, life's always been difficult. He's not talking about singing new songs. Now, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but we do have to realize that Amazing Grace was a new song at one point. Mm -hmm. It was contemporary in the day in which it was written. And we have to be careful not to take the posture that the Pharisees took where older is better, and the older it is, the better it is. Because Jesus made it clear here to the Pharisees and to John's disciples, when it comes to spiritual things, older isn't always better. I'm glad we're not under the law. Yeah. Amen. I'm glad we don't have to bring animal sacrifices right. to offer for yes. our sins anymore. Yes. Yes. But we have to be careful not to try to fit God and the new things he might want to do into our perception of what he's allowed to do. Yeah. That's what the Pharisees did. And that's when, why Jesus went out of his way to explain this question to the genuine believers that asked him. So when we look back at verses 15 through 17, why is this illustration so important? Why do we need to really get this? Well, we saw last week that only 5% of those in ages 18 through 35 are active in their faith. Remember, we had all the kids up here on stage. We had a lot of kids here last week. Praise God, we had a lot of kids last week. But we had everybody except for one go back down and sit with their parents. And what the question was, is this what we want to show for our life and ministry? After years of being here, do we want that these kids to grow up and leave the church and be left with one out of 20? Is that what we want? Mm. Two-thirds of children and teens that grow up in the church stop attending completely between the ages of 18 and 22. Almost 70% of 18 to 29-year-olds that grew up in church withdraw from church involvement as an adult. And do we remember the reasons that they give? They perceive the church to be judgmental, hypocritical, and irrelevant. Does that sound like Pharisees? Yes. Judgmental? Absolutely. Hypocritical? When I see you next week, God called them, Jesus called them hypocrites eight times in the series about 13 verses. <laughs> yep. Well, won't you describe the Pharisees hypocrites? And did they hold to the practices that weren't relevant? Absolutely. Yes. That's right. Now yeah. Jesus didn't include this just for the Pharisees. We see that 
believers can learn a lot from this illustration too. Jesus came to make it clear to both the unsaved Pharisees and the saved believers of John the Baptist, followers of John, that he was initiating change. Now, we bring this up, and I'm not talking about compromise because Jesus wasn't talking about compromise. That's right. I'm talking uh, about change because Jesus talked about change. Right. And understand, this is coming from someone who does not like change. Right. Amen. But if that's the posture that I take spiritually, then I miss out on the main point of Jesus' life and ministry. He came to change things. Mm-hmm. He came to do new things. In John chapter 1, verse 29, he presented a new sacrifice. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So those old sacrifices are irrelevant anymore. You don't, got to, you don't got to do that. In John chapter 2, he presents himself as a new temple. He said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it back up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Referring to his body. That's right. In John chapter 3, he talked about a new birth. He told Nicodemus, You must be born again. Yeah. Remember, we saw last week the Pharisees were proud of their birth. They were proud of their heritage. He said, We have Abraham to our father. He said, That's not what matters anymore. John chapter 4, he talks about the woman of the well about a new type of worship. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth. John chapter 5, he presents a new Sabbath where Jesus deliberately healed a man on the Sabbath. I love that. This man had been, it said he'd been burdened with affliction for 38 years. He could have waited one more day. Jesus healed him specifically on the Sabbath and said, you know what? The Sabbath isn't what matters anymore. That's right. I'm bringing something new. I'm doing something new. Hmm. John chapter 6, he, he refers to a new man where he said that I'm the bread of life. That was that was hard for the Jews to understand because they knew about manna. That's what the saying. He said, look, you don't need that old man anymore. i got something new for you. In verse 7, he presents himself as new water. He says, whoever is thirsty, let him drink. As the scripture said, out of the, his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Yes. And in John chapter 8, he presents a new light. Now, the, G- the Jews knew all about the pillar of fire that had guided them in the wilderness, but Jesus went out of his way and said, look, I'm not just the light of the Jews, I'm the light of the world. Amen. 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 And these were all teachings that we know and we understand, but we have to understand these were completely radical teachings to the Jews and Pharisees. In John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus talks about a new flock, where he says that there's going to be one flock and one shepherd. And here's the thing. If there are believers that actually believe in Christ, that worship differently than us, guess what? We don't need to draw lines of delineation and say, well, they're part of that tribe or that flock. No, we all have the same shepherd, which means we're all the same flock. When you stop for looking for reasons separate from other believers, that's nonsense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's ridiculous. In John chapter 13, he says a new commandment that covers all the other commandments. A new commandment I give you that you love others as I love you. Mm-hmm. John verse 15, he, or John chapter 15 rather, he presents himself as a new vine. Now in the Old Testament, the Jews were the vine, but Jesus said in John chapter 15, I am the true vine and you're the branches. In John chapter 18, he presents a new kingdom. He told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. That's right. Come on. And what Jesus was saying to the religious leaders of his day was that everything is new, but it comes out of the old. But if nothing ever comes out of the new, God's work doesn't go forward. And there's a key text to guide us as we look how to apply these teachings to our lives. Because let's admit, most of us don't like change. Most of us, most of us like church the, the same way we've always had church. Most of us like our preferences, we like our priorities, we like our standards. Because we need, but I, I love that Jesus gives us a verse to guide us through difficult things like this. Because if we're opposed to change just because it's different, guess who we're identifying with? The Pharisees. But if you keep your spot here, turn to just a couple chapters, Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. Matthew chapter 13, down to verse 52. Jesus here is speaking. And he's talking here to believers. He was talking to, he was preparing his followers for the changes that were about to take place. He, he, he told them that, he was, you know, that, that salvation wasn't just for the Jews anymore, it was going to be for the Gentiles. That was revolutionary, they didn't know that. There's going to be different people being saved, people practicing their faith in different ways. And he's trying to prepare them for that. But look, you're going to see some different things. And look what he says here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. Jesus says, Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe, and scribe here is using, referring to a student, not the person who would write down the law, how Paul wrote to Timothy and said, study to show thyself approved. That's what he's talking about. Anybody who is studying to, uh, to be equipped for God's kingdom and for his purpose, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, 
which bringeth forth out of his treasure things both new and old. And what we see at the end of that verse is that we have to be diligent to identify and bring out that which is valuable. The treasure Amen. of things both new <clears throat> and old. And the implication is just that if we're doing things that aren't spiritually valuable, if we're doing them just because we've always done them a certain way, that's not a good enough reason, and it's certainly not a biblical reason to continue doing them that way. The verse says, Jesus says, clearly, if you have a red-letter Bible, this is written in red. These are words of Jesus. He says, there is value in both the old and in the new. Mm-hmm. And speaking to us as our church, uh, those people that, that, that tune in online, I, I hope they get something out of this. I'm, I'm glad they do. But when I prepare messages, I believe that God gives me messages for our people. That's how I believe how God speaks to it, to, to pastors to convey yes. words to his people. Yes, amen. If we only find value, if we only find comfort, if we only treasure and appreciate that which is old, you know who we're acting like? The Pharisees. And he gives us this illustration to demonstrate the importance of making sure that we don't unintentionally or unknowingly take on those characteristics that we should be trying to avoid. And if we're holding to our own personal preferences, our own standards, or the way things we've always done, just because that's the way they've always been done, then we miss the point of why we even exist. We exist to exalt God. But the Pharisees missed that because they were opposed to him. We exist to reach sinners, but they missed that because they separated from and isolated themselves from sinners. We exist for God's glory. And Jesus gives the illustration that his desire is to pour new wine into new bottles. But if we're not willing to become new, if we're not willing to change, if we're not willing to try anything new, what he says is we'll miss out on what he really wants to do through us. And the Pharisees miss that. Let's make sure we don't miss it. We don't want our bottle to burst. Right. We don't want the wine to run out. We don't want the bottles, we don't want our worship, we don't want our impact to fail to reach the loss around us or end up being empty. But if we fail to change, we will. We have to ask ourselves, am I inadvertently opposed to Christ because I'm unwilling to go to certain people and sit down with them and share the gospel with them? Am I individually, or we collectively as a church, are we opposed to Christ because we refuse to do anything new? Now, it's easy to get stuck in our ways. But we see here, if we remain to be, if we we turn into old bottles, God's not going to pour any new wine into us. We'll simply, we'll simply dry up, empty out, and completely miss the purpose of what God wanted to do through us. If we get a heavy head bowed and every head closed.